Hey everybody, Cats and TV. Now these days, finding your location anywhere on Earth is often as simple as looking at your phone. But before GPS, finding an accurate latitude and longitude was not quite so simple. This is particularly true for longitude, and especially at sea. Accurate longitudinal reading long relied on a device called the marine chronometer, and that is the subject of today's video. For centuries, mariners relied on celestial bodies like the sun, moon, and stars to navigate on the open seas, out of sight of land. Measuring latitude was straightforward, using the sun's angle above the horizon at noon, or in the northern hemisphere, the angle of Polaris, the North Star. The formula for Polaris is simply the angle of the horizon. With the sun, there is an additional step of using an almanac to determine the declination, or difference from its angle on the equinox. Now longitude turns out to be much harder to measure. First, we set a fixed line of longitude on the Earth. By convention, this is the prime meridian that crosses through Greenwich, England, and is also the source of Greenwich Mean Time. Local time can be determined by sightings of celestial bodies with a sextant, an almanac, and sight reduction tables. So then, one uses the difference between the local time and Greenwich Mean Time to determine longitude via spherical trigonometry. But knowing Greenwich Mean Time required a very accurate clock that would remain accurate while carried on a ship. Enter the Marine Chronometer. The most accurate clocks until the 20th century were pendulum clocks. But with the rolling of a ship at sea and the vagaries of the Earth's gravity, pendulum clocks were pretty much useless for the purpose of navigation. So the quest was on to develop a new timepiece that would remain stable at sea. Christian Huygens, who is credited with inventing the pendulum clock, tried his hand at creating a marine chronometer using a balance wheel and spring. Although his design was not successful, it did inspire others, such as Robert Hooke, famous for Hooke's Law of Springs. In 1714, the British government offered a prize for the development of a marine chronometer, totaling up to 20,000 pounds, which at the time was a load of money. Among those who took up this challenge was a carpenter in Yorkshire named John Harrison. He submitted his first design of a marine chronometer in 1730 and secured the funds to build his sea clock. Five years later, he completed his first model, a massive device that included rocking bars with balls on the ends, connected by a so-called grasshopper escapement. He demonstrated his sea clock to the Royal Society, who presented it to the Board of Longitude. Yes, there was a Board of Longitude. They agreed to a sea trial. Although the clock lost some time on the outward voyage, it performed well enough on the return voyage for Harrison to be granted the funds for further development. Now Harrison was not a trained physicist or engineer, really working in a DIY mode with trial and error. He corrected errors caused by the yawing motion of a ship as well as temperature fluctuations. His third model included such innovations as the caged roller bearing and the bimetallic strip, but it still failed to be accurate enough. Now before we continue, please subscribe to this channel for more cultural content coming out regularly. And please do consider supporting us. Links to our merch store, Patreon, and Ko-Fi are in the description below. And if you like what you see here, please give us a thumbs up and share with your friends. As Harrison was working on his massive sea clocks, parallel innovations led to the creation of watches that were as accurate, at least on land. He set about creating a much smaller sea watch in collaboration with London's best watchmakers. The end result was a masterpiece of engineering and design, about five inches in diameter, but containing some of the most complex clockwork of the day with coiled steel springs and escapements that contained, among other things, diamond pallets. Plus, it could maintain time while being wound. The Board of Longitude commissioned a trial run of Harrison's H4 model on a voyage from Portsmouth in England to Kingston, Jamaica, a trip undertaken by Harrison's son, William. When the Sea Watch arrived in Kingston, it was found to be five seconds slow, corresponding to about one nautical mile off the known longitude. The test was a success, but the Harrisons struggled to receive their prize from the Longitude Board. Rather than accept a smaller prize, they took their case to Parliament and even to the king. In the end, Harrison was able to receive additional money from Parliament, ultimately totaling over 23,000 pounds, though he never received the official prize.
In the 20th and 21st centuries, Harrison has finally gotten his due for his innovations and contributions. There are several memorials, including at the site of his home in London and in Westminster Abbey. Later clockmakers built and improved on Harrison's designs. They were expensive and complex to build, and later innovations such as those of John Arnold and Thomas Earnshaw brought the cost and complexity down to the point where marine chronometers became ubiquitous for navigation at sea in the 19th century. In the early 20th century, marine chronometers were able to be mass-produced. American models like the Hamilton 21 and 22 were used in World War II. After World War II, marine chronometers were gradually replaced by radio-based systems for navigation, and in the late 1990s by the GPS system that we now carry around in our pockets. But the legacy and historical significance of marine chronometers makes them prized collector's items today. Harrison's first four models can be found at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, which seems like a rather appropriate place for them. Now interestingly, especially for us at CatSynth, Harrison researched musical tunings in his later years, coming up with a mean tone system based on Pi. Who will save that for a future video? Do you have any questions or thoughts about marine chronometers? Or the life and legacy of John Harrison? Please let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe to CatSynth TV.